You, you, you are now listening to the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. Where we stop at nothing to bring you the right facts on health, fitness, and psychology. Featuring some of the world's most experienced professional professions. So you can learn, live, and win. With your hosts, Meg, Dr. D, and Mandy. After high school, I got into the pill scene and stuff. And from there, it was just... Yeah, it was absolute chaos from there. I got into uh, heroin for a little bit, and my life was just going in a bad direction. It was it was ugly. I found myself homeless in Lowell for a short period of time. And one morning, I just woke up on a park bench and realized I had nobody to call. I, I had nothing to my name. I smelled like absolute dog shit. It was like 30 fights that night. So a lot of guys that were fighting. So you're sizing everybody up. <laughs> and that's funny because our whole group of friends was saying, oh, look at that guy. He looks like Ivan Drago from Rocky IV. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> All this and more in today's episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of The Project. And in this episode, we are talking to Mark Costello. Literally, after the movie, A Cinderella Man. This guy is a total fucking Cinderella story. I grew up with Mark for many years. We had arguments, we had fights, we had laughs, we had tears together. We drove around in what we used to call the molester mobile, and we had a lot of fun. It was a big blue van, Meg, all right? We didn't do anything in there, but that's what all, everyone pegged it as. <laughs> it's it was not this a big, good name. <laughs> I know, right? But it was this big, Let's ugly Let's be ass. clear. We called it that to mess with our buddy that owned it. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was that like, was, hold on, this took a dark turn. That was, strictly, <laughs> <I'm out. laughs> that was strictly just directed at the person that owned that. Band. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which was me. <laughs> was that me? <laughs> But, but yeah, oh, Mark's man. a dear friend. And I mean, just Mark from where, where you were, dude. So, I mean, dude, just dive right into it. Talk about from, you know, from the high school days, dude, from back what, when it all started, when you showed up in my basement, you know, at three o'clock in the morning one night. <laughs> which parts do you want me to talk about? Which parts do you want me to leave out here, Maddie? <laughs> yeah, well, dude, well, you could talk about everything, dude. Anything and everything. I mean, you know. It, oh, we it, had good times, man. You know. Yeah, maybe a little too good sometimes, but <laughs> we're surviving. We're still here. That's true. That's true. And By the great God, right? Yeah, our motto was, if it doesn't kill you, it just makes you stronger. That's what we always used to say, the three of us, me, you, and Davey boy. Yeah, look where that got us, huh? <laughs> How many of the things that you did could have potentially killed you, though? <laughs> <laughs> the miracle was still here. Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right, so so Mark, yeah, start off from where it all started, buddy. Yeah, it all started off in your basement, Maddie. You're to blame for all this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, at least you're throwing haymakers for cancer. I think that's the the most important thing. Why we brought you on here, so. Oh yeah, that you know what I'm wanted to be a part of this group, man. It's really cool, and the fact is, is it's the tenth year, the tenth year they've done this, so it's their tenth anniversary, and we're looking to break records here, money wise. It's it's going pretty well so far. They. Our goal is about 850000 and every penny earned goes straight to uh, cancer research. So yeah, explain a little bit of what that, that organization is, because I haven't heard of it, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners are probably curious about that too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's starting to blow up. It's called Haymakers for Hope. This group of people, they go around to local gyms and have people sign up to fight in their first amateur fight, and we get a chance to raise as much money as we possibly can for cancer while we're doing it, while we're training stuff like that. We get money from ticket sales, t-shirt sales, fundraising, people get to donate. It's just really, it's a, it's a really cool thing. And in this whole journey, we learn a cool little, uh, little trick in, in the fight world. That's awesome. So yeah. like, you're just going specifically like boxing gyms. Is this like any yeah. other style of fighting or what's yeah. the. It's strictly yeah. boxing and it's going to okay. be held at the house of blues in Boston. Oh, that's it's awesome. About 2000 tickets, 2,500 tickets that get sold. So it's pretty wow. wild to do your first fight, first amateur fight in front of that many people, you Amazing. know, yeah. for such a good cause. Yeah. So did you start this organization or how, what's your involvement with it? No, I just signed up through the gym. I had no idea about it, but then, uh, I signed up for a local gym with my nephew to get him into sports a little bit. Me and my wife just got custody of him and his brother. So oh, wow. we were kind of looking for a way to bond a little bit. And I took him down to this gym and a few of the girls were training to do women's one. Okay. And we went to watch it there and I fell in love with it. You know, it's 
just a great cause and a great experience. So is boxing something you grew up doing or how did oh, you? Five months ago, you know? So oh, shit. That's awesome. I'm telling you, I'm 36 years old and I'm just starting to, uh, I'm in five months of boxing. I've already taken six fights. Wow. So, yeah, it's been a blast. It's, it's quite the trip. Who would have thought? Well, you got you a know? hard head, Marky. All right. I've seen you put it through oh, yeah. many walls, buddy. <laughs> My head so, hard, but. Was it the haymakers that kind of encouraged you to get into boxing in the first place? Or you just wanted to start boxing and then stumbled upon haymakers while you were in the gym? No, like I said, we had just recently, me and my wife, who I'm actually fighting for, got custody of our two nephews. And he mm. had never really been into sports, the 14-year-old. And we wanted to introduce him to the sport world, you know, make some friends, stuff like that. So I took him down to the gym, the boxing gym, to see if he had an interest and I wound up doing it with him. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Great, great, great in West Roxbury down the street from us. Blocksmith, boxing gym. It's, it's awesome. Great place. And at 36 years old to pick up a sport like boxing, what's that like? <laughs> oh, my God. I've never been so sore in my life. I tell you. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, I'm obsessed with the coordination, you know, piece that's required in boxing, just from the top of your body to the bottom, from your left to your right. I just, yeah, I think that's absolutely incredible. You. Who would have thought so much goes into throwing a punch? Right. It's insane. You know what it is? It's the conditioning that is you learn that you're out of shape when you start mm. boxing. I tell you. Exactly. Holy smokes. I could have had a heart attack in my first week. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, Mark, don't sell yourself short. You were a hockey player. You know, you were a great hockey player when you were younger in high school. Many more. Oh, Maddie. It was many <laughs> moons ago, but you still have it. You, you still got the coordination there. So, you know, don't yeah, sell I mean, yourself hey, short. We're standing. Oh, yeah, we're awesome. still standing. We're still doing it. So, But how's the journey been, man? Like, how has it been? I mean, obviously, we wanted to bring you on this show to talk about the haymakers and, you know, the organization and everything that goes into it. But also, how's your journey been from a mental and a physical state to where it is now? Yeah, absolutely. I could touch on that. I mean, Maddie, you know how deep it can go with me. I could take you to the end of the world and back here. You know well about me. After high school, I got into the pill scene and stuff. And from there, it was just, yeah, it was absolute chaos from there. I got into uh, heroin for a little bit and my life was just going in a bad direction. It was, it was ugly. I found myself homeless in Lowell for a short period of time. And one morning I just woke up on a park bench and realized I had nobody to call. I, I had nothing to my name. I smelled like absolute dog shit. I was at an all time low. And luckily I found my way to the hospital and got the help I needed and bounced back big time. Now I, uh, I'm a full-time carpenter. I got a beautiful family. I fell in love with my wife, Denise, a few years back and we got custody of our two kids. It's been from an all time low to an all time high and a matter of no time. I'll tell you what. And then to throw this into the mix, it's just more motivation to keep doing the right thing. I guess how long was that from the first time it started with pills until you waking up on that bench and kind of having that moment? I guess how long was that that process? I mean, it, it happens faster than you would like it to. It's I started doing pills probably when I was 20, just recreational, having fun with it out at parties. And, and then it started spiraling downhill, being becoming more of a daily thing probably around 22, 23. And I too, I was one of those people that said, I'd never get into anything harder than doing pills. And this is, I could stop whenever. And before you knew it, I had a needle in my arm. And this lasted for till I was about, God, I don't even know, 30 years old, probably. 10 years. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's ten years, a complete blur. I mean, you remember when it started, Matt, you guys always tried to talk me down off that ledge, but there was just something about it that I fell in love with hardcore. Did you ever, I guess, in the recovery process, is that something that they kind of have you work through is like, what was the appeal to it at that time? Or what were, you know, yeah, what were you like trying to were to it? Why you, you know what I mean? You got to dig deep and really find out what caused you to keep repeating these behaviors. And why did I keep going back to this? What can I change? Who can I change being around? I mean, you got to realter your entire life just to get this right. But it's, it comes down to whether or not you want to have a good life or you want to, I mean, I was inevitably going to end up dead. Right. So it couldn't have gone on much longer anyways. I was either going to wind up in the ground in jail or get the help I needed. Right. Luckily, I found what I needed. I was going to say, what pulled you out of that? So you, you went to the hospital, you say you kind of had that 
waking up and having that thought of, you know, it can't go much longer like this. And then that process of recovery, was it once you made that choice? I mean, I'm sure there were some, some struggles through that, or what are some of the biggest things you contributed towards you being able to continue in that process despite setbacks or, you know, anything? Yeah, I'll tell you that more than I woke up in low, I'll never forget it. That feeling that just overcame me. I never had felt that before. I had been in and out of detox and rehabs and always it was the same exact thing. I can beat this. I can do this. I can do this. And I never really got to that low point where I meant it until I woke up on that bench and just had nowhere to go, nobody to call. I missed everybody. I sat there like a little kid with with no one to reach out to as a grown man, just bawling my eyes out, realizing that this is it. Either I'm going to die or I'm going to get the help. And somehow I found the strength to walk myself to the hospital and tell them I needed to check myself in before I did something stupid. Oh, that's amazing. I have chills just listening to you talk about it. Like I, yeah, oh, I pre- man. yeah it's crazy. But you know what? These are the things I got to keep up front and remember. I got to remember how I felt that morning I woke up and just had nobody, you know? Right. Right. I so mean, it still pokes me up thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so from walking into the hospital that time after the bench, I guess, like, I'm just curious how the recovery process works. Like, how long do they keep you there? Or how long before, like, you're kind of just back at home and trying to do it on your own? Or what's yeah. the depth of a process for somebody who, like you said, you had no one to count on, you had nothing to your name. So I'm just curious, like, how does someone get help? in that situation. You just got to ask, man, there's people out there that are more than willing to help. I had a complete stranger just take me in that hospital, sit with me for hours and talk to me about what was going on. And they wouldn't leave my side until they got me to the detox that I needed to be because they knew I was in a vulnerable state. And this guy, he was just a social worker that came in and his job was to just sit with me and make sure that nothing, uh, I didn't do anything to harm myself or anybody else around me or try to leave. And, you know, this guy could have easily been like, you know what, screw this, I'm out of here. But he just sat with me, he talked with me about life and how I can get everything back and it was going to take time and heartwarming to think about stuff like that. Absolutely. Asking for help is a huge skill. I think I'll, a lot of people don't think of it as a skill, but it's pretty damn important. You know, it's <laughs> and then I went to the detox. I was there for a few days. I moved into a program in Bornwood. It's called Bornwood. It was a, it's, it was a sober house that I was allowed to live at, but I had to go to that day program and work their day program for a while. Learn some skills on coping and how to deal with it and what to do in certain situations. And it just gives you a chance to network and get your emotions in check after that detox. Cause that's really when the reality of what you did starts to set in. Cause when you got a clear mind, you never think you would do the things you do when you're struggling, looking to get high, you know, and that's realization to you as a sober person of the things that you did while you were messed up is just, it can take its toll. So. It's good to be monitored like that, where I had somewhere to go every single day until they thought, all right, we can graduate you from this program and you can go out on the working world. I stayed living in the sober house for a little bit, so I'm still around a good network of guys that were keeping an eye on me. And luckily, while I was in there, I met who I'm married to now, my beautiful wife, and she really straightened me out. She's a great woman, and she was a big motivation for me. That's amazing. She was there as, like, working, or was she just going through a similar thing? In the house, yeah. Yeah. She had had 10 years clean, and she was friends... So it was kind of through networking. I met her through an addict, another addict that she was friends with helping in the house. So that was cool. So how was the bounce back, dude? I mean, after that, like, how was the climb back to the top to where you are right now, dude? It's been surreal, man. I mean, I think about where I was and where I'm at now, and I don't have everything that somebody could possibly dream of. But what I have right now is unbelievable compared to where I was at. I never am... million years would have thought I am I'm where I'm at I'm married I got custody of two amazing kids that are just bring so much joy to me and my wife we got a rescued pit that we love with all our heart we have a beautiful home full-time jobs food in our fridge it's wild I never thought I'd be here I mean you've seen some of my fridges Maddie (laughs) (laughs) cheese milk and beer that was pretty much it I was just going to say the, uh, getting back into like working or that, those like first interviews and and things like that, trying to, I mean, I'm sure it was just a complete shift and change and pace and life and everything. And going into some of those first interviews, I guess what, what did that feel like? 
I'm sorry. What What do you mean? Like job interviews and stuff? Yeah. Like just like getting out of like finally feeling in a place where you have a little bit more control, like you said, over your emotions and things. And now getting into a place where you're networking maybe a little bit outside of who's in the sober house and, you know, looking to make a living and getting into work and to find something that you enjoy doing. I mean, it sounds like you have some passion for what you're doing for work right now. Oh, absolutely. I'm very lucky. I, I, uh, I'm a carpenter by trade and I absolutely, I fell in love with doing what I do at a young age. My grandfather had a woodworking shop. I have my carpenter. My uncle was always a carpenter and I always helped him work in. So I kind of fell right back into that. I went to what I was comfortable with, but it was also what was a passion of mine. So I could put a lot of my energy towards what I enjoy doing. And that kept my idle hands busy, which was real good. I can imagine there's a lot of, you know, society expectations of after bouncing off of something like that, of, you know, having a certain kind of job or just getting a job in general, it might not be something you enjoy. So the fact that you were able to recognize what you did enjoy and turn that into something that could provide a living for you. I think that's, that's just a huge journey and process of its own. I think for a lot of people, they're stuck doing something that they don't like doing. And for someone coming off of a, an addiction, you know, that can often be a reason I think for probably relapsing. Oh, absolutely. The stigma that comes with being an addict is just, it can be absolutely crippling. You can let it pick you, you can let it make, you can let it make you, you know, you can use it as a driver. You can, like you said, let it cripple you and just settle for less. You know, don't think you deserve better, but everybody, you can, you get second, third chances in this world. You know, you, you got to take it and you got to run with it. Absolutely. But it can be absolutely tough. You feel like you're going for a job interview and this, you you got heroin addict written across your forehead. This guy automatically knows those feelings are there, but you got to look to overcome those and start looking at yourself as a person and not an addict. Any somebody that deserves a good life. Right. Yeah. Sure. Wow, dude, that's deep, man. I'm, I mean, Marky, I'm sorry I wasn't there for you, brother. I mean, at this time, I was in Kuwait, so... No, I'm dude, I put myself in that position. That's what I had to realize, you know? For a while, I blamed other people. Oh, nobody will reach out to me. Nobody wants to talk to me. Fuck it. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. But I was the one that wasn't reaching out. I wasn't asking for the help. I was the one that was secluding myself from everybody. And I had to realize that and pick the blame up and run with it myself to get help. So how long have you had custody of your kids now? We've had them, honey. What is? How long has it been? Well, it's been about two years now. It was a month okay. after we got married, actually. Oh, awesome. I guess how open are you guys with your with this kind of stuff with your kids, and and I guess how does that play a part in in parenting? Uh, you know, it's gonna play. It's stuff that we still deal with right now. They're still both very young. The fourteen right. year old, we're we're honest with him, and any he knows any question he has, we'll answer. We'll be honest with him. We'll be truthful. I mean. Yeah, it's what we did in the past, but it's not who we are now. Right. And I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Realize, sorry about that. As mm-hmm. long as they realize that and know that their best interest is our biggest priority now, and that part of us is behind us, and they're number one in our hearts, that's what matters to us. Absolutely. And I think, well, you know, the 14 year old, he grew up with it, with the addiction. That's how he wound up with us, you know? He's very familiar, very aware. And the last thing we would want to do is lie to him about it and hide anything from him. So, And it's good for him, too, because he sees these two people that came from this world living the correct way. There's Maybe there's hope in his foreseeable future for other people that he cares about. That's huge. That's huge. I think just being able to feel comfortable asking your parents <laughs> questions is a, that's just a huge achievement. Absolutely. You know, anyway, as a parent. Harder than I am too. So I can't dance around any questions with them. <laughs> right. Right. But that's something I need. I mean, I know Maddie is like in Kuwait, that's a huge thing. I think a lot of people there, because there is so much society pressure on image and things, it's anything like this that comes up, it's out of sight, out of mind, keep it hush, hush, don't talk about it, try to, you know, just blindfold over the eyes. And then you, you just see the problem spiraling even, even worse. So yeah, absolutely. And in Massachusetts, I think, I mean, it's got one of the biggest heroin problems in the United States, I think, like, it's really bad in, uh, in Massachusetts, right, Mark? I mean, you could probably, you could probably, yeah, it's up there, man. It's it's a battle every day. What do you think that why? Why Boston? Honestly, I think it's everywhere now to tell you the truth. Right. I think when it first started out it was a select few cities, but now it's affecting everybody everywhere. At first it was just bad neighborhoods and then it's scaled into it's everywhere. 
Mm-hmm. Stay safe from jail, from Yale to jail, you know? Right, wow. right. Wow. And everybody. And that's important. You talk about the stigmas that are associated with that. And I think that's really important of like, this can affect anybody. Like we were just talking about, I hate to bring it up, but coronavirus and how people, you know, kind of feel like they're just invincible to it. And I think that society wise, there's a certain status level that people think if they get to, they're kind of invincible from dealing with some dark things like this. And that's, it can affect anybody. And I think we all suffer from some level of an addiction to something, um, oh, you know, see, whether it be eating or gambling or whatever, right. Whatever you know? your escape is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, Mark, what about the physical part? Because, I mean, obviously, if you're when you were probably down and out, you probably lost a lot of muscle. You probably lost a lot of body mass, too, dude. Oh, it was bad, man. I was like a little skeleton. A stiff wind could have blew me over. Really, dude? <laughs> now, we're, we're talking about a guy who was a big, burly guy when we were growing up. I mean, he I've, I've wrestled with Mark a few times and got my ass whooped by him <laughs> plenty of times. <laughs> but I did break his thumb. <laughs> I did. Maddie, I, I remember think... that. I did break my thumb. You sicko, <laughs> Maddie. I think this summer when you go back to uh, Boston, I think you should maybe do your first amateur fight. <laughs> I, get him in the ring. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> we'll do a live cast of it. Oh yes, please. Dude, see, see, Meg. The thing is, is Mark knows I'm stupid enough that he says, "Maddie, let's do it." I'd probably do it. You'll like do it. Oh, yeah. oh, he'll get it. We'll make this happen. Yes. Dude, I, I would not step in a ring with you, man. You still want revenge on me for snapping your thumb, buddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's awesome. yeah, uh, yeah, it still hurts when it rains, I'll tell you. I'm sorry. Oh, shit. No, mate, I, he had me in a bear hug, right? And I kept telling him, Mark, I'm a little guy. Like, I'm, I'm a lot smaller than Mark. Mark's like six. Scrappy. He's 5'11", and he's like 260 pounds. And I'm like, Mark. Let me go, Mark. You just take him 260 pounds. You were, dude. You were a big boy, man. Like you're a big guy. You know, like like back then you were a big guy, you know. And he didn't want oh, me was, to, yeah. He had me in the bear hug and I just snapped his thumb, just ripped it back. <laughs> That's hilarious. But oh, but he and the funny I, thing the funny thing is, is we were still hanging out like 20 minutes later. He wasn't even pissed. <laughs> yeah, that's how boys kind of are though. <laughs> you guys get over it quick. <laughs> that's funny. So I guess, yeah, going back to Maddie's question, kind of like the the health aspect and journey of it, like are there things that still kind of linger, I guess, from the past experience of of going through the, you know, the drugs and things that you were messing with or what's your lifestyle like now as far as like nutrition and fitness and those kinds of things or how was that it's night and day compared to how i was living i mean i was lucky to have a bag of doritos a week back then right. when i was getting messed up honestly i've never felt so good in my life i'm 36 years old and i'm in the best shape of my life now i've gone from i started boxing five months ago i was 250 pounds i'm down to 219 right now i'm eating good eating healthy exercising every day getting the rest i need going to work i i mean i feel great that's awesome you should check out yeah. his facebook page because that's what made me want to bring him on the show is because the the transformation that he went through body wise and like mentally you can see it in in the videos you can see it in the pictures and i mean mark i mean dude i tip my hat to you man like you've come a long way brother you've come a real long Thanks. way and what you're doing for such a good cause is amazing and why boxing, dude? Hey, why not, right? Yeah, it's, all, it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> that no, is... it's like I told you, I, do, I wanted to find a common ground that uh, me and my nephew could do, you know, have something in common with and go do together. We walked in there and I figured it was just going to be some workout classes, hit the bags with the kid a little bit, throw some mitts. And next thing I knew, I was in my first fight a month later. And <laughs> I absolutely loved it. Yeah, yeah, it's a good time. You take your licks and you get every now and then and you get to give a few (laughs) so good times so what's your training like right now like well how many times a week are you going um how many hours you putting in at the gym do you have a full-time like do you have a coach that you you know answer to that you work with or how does all that work right now for you yeah i got the best coach in the game maddie her name is jess smith she runs blocksmith out of west roxbury i'm gonna throw the plug in right there oh go ahead Um, dude go ahead man i'll bring her on the show if she wants to come on i'll bring her on the show dude i'd love to have her on the show great man and she you know what she runs such a good program and she's so involved with every single one of her fighters that it's just such on a very personal level that you find this trust in her. And that's, I think that's real important when you're boxing because when you step in that ring, you step in there alone. So her job is huge to get you ready to that be at that level. And she does an amazing job with that. 
But uh, as far as training, yeah, I'm training every single day. I go Monday and Wednesdays to group classes. And uh, then I do sparring later that night on Monday and Saturdays. I do a private class with her on Sundays. And then I'm at the gym on the opposite days, either doing cardio or strength and core training. God, you've gone down the rabbit hole real quick. Yeah, that a boy, Marky. That a boy, Marky. You got a new addiction. Absolutely. That one's not as bad. Right. <laughs> right. This one's a lot better, Start, especially if they start yeah. riding in the streets for Corona. At least you can protect yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I'm a CrossFitter. All I can fucking do is wad. <laughs> yeah, I got to get my toilet paper somehow, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But not thumb wrestling for it, apparently. <laughs> oh, no thumb wrestling. You ruined that career quick. God damn it, Maddie. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I fucked up your thumb war, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I'm so excited to look up a boxing. It's something, like I said, it's something I've always wanted to get into. But I think just hearing that you're 36 and that's when you picked it up. It uh, just totally gave me a big kick in the ass right now. Like, what the fuck are you waiting for? Just try yeah, it. <laughs> get down there. You'd love it. I'm telling you right now. Even yeah. if it, my wife, I even got my wife down there doing the workouts now. She just, she doesn't do the fights. She just goes and does the classes and she loves it, man. That's awesome. I got her down there. I got my nephew down there. It's a family I sport. I think that's so cool that you guys are all doing it together. That's, I mean, more families need to find something like that, that they can bond over that isn't Absolutely. It's a good a bonding screen. experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So what are the yeah. classes like? Is it more of like a box and burn type of class or like what's the what's the setup? It's intense stuff, man. It's an hour straight of just working out. It's doing bur- 20 burpees in a row and then hitting the heavy bags 200 times, dropping right down into some mountain climbers. And you're doing this for an hour straight. It's intense. Working the mitts with her. It, it, it all depends because like, and I do my private classes with her and we're working on footwork and we're working on defense but the group classes are more like cardio and getting your heart rate up for the whole hour it's so, amazing what do you find the most helpful for recovery from intense workouts like that? i mean because you're in there every day doing shit <laughs> so what's been like your... and you're a carpenter too right right yeah. you're a lot of physical work that probably helps you right there it's just always moving but What's the recovery process? Yeah, the best thing you can do is just get the proper rest that you need. Don't overdo it, Amen. you know, because get into this zone where you just want to keep going and going. But you got to know that even though you feel good right now, you may do damage for tomorrow. You got to know your limits, get plenty mm-hmm. of rest, and your diet's important too. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to get the same results out of your workout if you're not eating the right way or getting enough water in. Yeah. So every, every little factor plays such a big part when you're trying to do something this physical and this demanding. Do you think that understanding your threshold on that of like physically when you need to, to rest and stuff, do you think you're a little more turned on to that just because of you pushing that threshold so hard previously? Oh, absolutely. You learn the hard way, unfortunately. Right. Oh, you, you think you're getting in a little better workout than you have the rest of the days, but then you wake up the next day and you can't work out as hard because you overdid it. You know, you learn the hard way where to, all right, I pushed it enough. Now I can stop. I got to go get some rest, get some food in me, get some energy, and then I can start over tomorrow and push myself a little bit further. It's awesome that you can recognize that. It's yeah. Same for myself. I, it took a massive muscle injury for me to, I think, recognize that point. And then it became a battle between the brain and the body of like having a really hard time getting back into it at all. <laughs> right. Then, yeah, know where you, you want to be, but right. you're not quite there. So you, you try to force yourself, I think, a little bit. Yeah. Just human nature, I think. Yeah, definitely. So, dude, real quick, because we talked about we touched on it a little bit about being 36 years old and getting into it. And you talked that you hit on an important point about footwork. Now, the coordination that it takes to box and the coordination in sports in general. Dude, how's that been like getting into the footwork side of it? Like, I mean, say I'm in the same boat. I'm going to be 37 in May and I'm doing CrossFit, learning how to walk on my hands and shit and do bar muscle ups and stuff. So the coordination's tough. So how is it for you? Because it's the same as like hockey and baseball that your feet do a lot, especially in boxing. So how's that been? It's uh, It's been interesting. It's definitely there, you know. When you first start, when I first started out boxing again, I thought my feet were just going to naturally come back, but it took a couple of weeks to get my feet back under me, but they do feel good. I think from being an athlete, it came back more natural. I mean, I still am not, I'm not Muhammad Ali in there. I know that, you know. Oh, come on. I'm a far cry. (laughs) 
but <laughs> but it definitely helps the mm-hmm. the being an athlete in a past life you know the muscle memory comes back a little bit and i think that helps me move around there a little better than i normally would be able to had i not played hockey all those years well i mean in general dude you like you were an all-out athlete when you know when we were younger you take we'd go play basketball if we had nothing to do i think that was the best part it was basketball during the day and go have fun at nights you know it was something like along we were always lines. something weren't we i know dude. sign of the times <laughs> But, <laughs> but even when we got into trouble, we always had a basketball in the car and we'd go to a school that was closed up and, you know, just shoot, shoot hoops till three o'clock in the morning. And that was a regular routine of ours. Absolutely. It was. Yeah. We had a good time doing it, didn't we? Yeah. Every night at Coolidge, man. Yeah, we'd go to Coolidge. <laughs> we'd go to Lil' Just School over there. So Mark's been an athlete his whole life. But dude, now what goes through your mind when you step in the ring right now as a 36 year old, you know, like your first bout, can you walk us through that of how that was? Was it, did you have like some people say I was in there fighting for my life again? You know, I've heard that story of when they, you know, they came from rock bottom to the top and they say I was fighting for my life or I was fighting for this or I was having flashbacks. How was it for you, dude? Yeah, that's all cool and shit, but I was just trying not to get knocked out. That a boy. That a boy, Marky. I love you, buddy. No philosophy behind it. I love you, man. That's all you can do is take what's right in front of you, though. Yeah, what am I supposed to do? I'm in the corner. But that bell rings. No matter what I'm thinking, he's going to come try and hit my head off. Yeah. You got to be ready at that point. Did you know the guy you were fighting the first time, or is it a stranger? No, no. I actually met him about 15 minutes before I fought him. (laughs) What's that like? I guess that whole, I mean, you see that with, with fighters, you know, the, uh, there is a lot of good sportsmanship, I think, uh, in the community, obviously you take, yeah, he wound up being a great guy. It was funny though, because we had all noticed them walk around the gym. We we're like, Oh, I wonder who you're fighting. I wonder, it was like 30 fights that night. So a lot of guys that were fighting. So you're sizing everybody up and <laughs> it's kind of funny. Cause our whole group of friends was saying, Oh, look at that guy. He looks like Ivan Drago from Rocky Fort. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, boy, this is going, don't you? In the back of my head saying, Oh yeah, this is him. They were all calling him Ivan Drago from Rocky Four. All of a sudden, yeah, this is the guy you're fighting, sure as shit. You fight Ivan Drago. <laughs> so Yeah, I was looking across the ring at that monster. His legs were the size of a redwood. Oh, and uh, man. Yeah, hey, once that bell rings, all that goes out the window. I think yeah. we had a good fight against them, I think. And uh yeah, you learn from every every fight. You get a little bit, you, the nerves settle a little bit every fight. Every time you step in that ring, you feel a little bit more comfortable, you know? Believe it or not, the more relaxed you are in a fight, the better you, you're you off. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure. You know, you see more. Mm-hmm. You're more aware. That makes sense. So what are you doing for strength? You, you talked about your cardio. So what are you doing for strength and conditioning for boxing? I mean, obviously, you still want to have muscle, but you still want to have quickness too so absolutely you just kind of stick to a push pull routine you know what i'm talking about maddie yeah three day gym was just pushing and pulling 15 reps of everything three sets keep it light but keep it fast good form you you want to work on your speed as well well as your strength but you don't want to mm-hmm. be bulky in the ring yeah and so i think you got to put up high numbers low weight but it's it's hard work you want minimal rest in between sets yeah. Maddie, have you ever done the CrossFit workout fight gone bad? No, I haven't done that one yet. I haven't nah. done that oh, one God, yet. Oh God, that's one. It like simulates the, it's like, f- you know, five minute rounds and you get a minute break. So it simulates like the UFC style. Um, oh no, wait, I think fighting. I did fight gone bad. I'm not sure. I don't know. I've done so many it of was them. But created I, by a fighter, but he basically, yeah, went through this workout. It's like a minute of each exercise and then you get a minute of rest and you go through that for uh, five times. And they asked him like at the end, how he felt. And he was like, it was like a fight gone bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's like I, I it's saw brutal. It. Uh, I honestly, I think I've done that one. I think Rob gave me that a few months ago. Yeah. But one. Mark, I mean, you brought up a good point because a lot of athletes, especially boxers or, you know, baseball players, hockey players, sometimes will go to the heavy weights and they'll go through that slow motion and they'll get into that routine where, you know, I've heard from a lot of pros and a lot of, you know, pro coaches, you want to go quick. If you want to develop those fast twitch muscle fibers versus that slow and controlled, which a bodybuilder usually does. Now, has your coach talked about that at all? Or, I mean, how's that? Like, is there any merit to that from your perspective when it comes to fighting? I mean, you've been in the weight room long enough, so. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, you want to work on those fast twitch muscles. You're doing lighter weight 
but you're doing a lot more reps. You want to do a couple controlled ones and then you want to crank a few out. Get, get that speed going. That way you get those fast twitch muscles can react on a dime. Yeah. You know, and you're working on a lot of that in the gym with the heavy bag. The, you don't want to work so much on throwing your power with your jab, but the speed of your jab and that return of that jab for the double, triple jabs. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. You can also find us on Instagram at The Project Kuwait. Thank you, and join us next time.